So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I am Damon Stone, just on the off chance that you have decided to attend this without any idea of who I am. And I will be speaking about uh, some influential Black musicians, uh, specifically in the uh, genres of blues and jazz. These are not the most influential necessarily. These are not necessarily my favorites. Um, it's just that these are some people that I believe are pretty important to know. Some of the names will probably be familiar to you, um, but I did definitely take a look at uh, trying to include some of the ones that are definitely less well-known um, or well-known to people who are in the know, um, but average fans uh, of the music or of the dance might not necessarily know much about uh, a couple of the names. Um, so uh, I am a blues, jazz, swing dancer amongst other styles. So I'm going to be talking about primarily the intersection of those things. So a lot of the artists that I'm gonna be talking about are going to be geared towards the um, very early days of both styles where there was a lot of um, crossover when the idea of blues and jazz being separate musics uh, and therefore separate scenes and separate dances uh, or dancers um, was pretty unknown. Uh, we'll start with uh, the, uh, oh, um, a statement. This is uh, billed as a lecture, but I really do enjoy um, conversation. Um, and as much as I have an hour's worth of material to share with you, it is always more meaningful for me, for you to get the information that you feel is important. So if you have questions, you should feel free to just unmute and speak up. Uh, or in the case of Emily, at least I will try and keep an eye on uh, the chat as well. Uh, if you wanna put in a question. So um, the first recorded uh, blues record uh, is Crazy Blues by Ma Rainey. Um, there is, uh, that fact is not actually super well known. Um, there were a number of uh, records prior to that used the term blues within its title, but were not blues in its composition. When they said blues, they were really talking more about evocative of a mood rather than um, the blues, be it um, like the emotional, I have the blues or the, this song is the blues. Um, the first use of blues title is Dallas Blues by Hart Wand. Um, it is a vaudevillian style hokum um, song. So if you listen to it, um, the context that it would have been played in is in a vaudevillian um, theater. The band would be on stage in between acts, which might be comedians, might be a minstrel show, um, might be burlesque, um, might be a... Um, esoteric uh, um, dancer who is performing and this is a song that might come on in between acts. Uh, again, it's Dallas Blues by Hart Wand. Um, I could not actually find a version of it, otherwise I would happily play it for, oh, it looks like uh, Edward managed to grab one. Um, some of these I have links already set aside if there is time to listen to them. But that one, I just did a very quick search. I'm like, nope, nope, and no, and I'm gonna move on. 
So um, when you get an opportunity, I recommend you clicking on the link that uh, Edward shared. <clears throat> Uh, just the piano score is enough in of itself, since the key here is that it is vaudevillian and not blues. And listening to um, listening to it uh, done on piano should um, help you understand what that difference is if you're not super uh, aware of it. So the first person we're going to talk about is Ma Rainey. Uh, she was born and raised in Columbus, Georgia, um, which is not that far away from where I currently live, which is Atlanta. Um, Ma Rainey was born Gertrude um, Pridget and uh, started singing as a teenager, um, primarily in minstrel shows and medicine shows. Now, you might be familiar with minstrel shows from a blacked up perspective as the, the things that white performers would do where they pretend to be black in the most offensive uh, stereotypical uh, fashions. But minstrel shows were also popular with uh, black people. Um, they just looked nothing like what the white performers and audiences uh, experienced. If you if you think about um, someone who has um, gotten a secondhand description of something and then does their interpretation of that secondhand description, um, hamming it up for uh, laughs, that is white minstrel city. Um, when you think about, oh, this is the real thing right here. Um, these people being the authentic selves, um, making jokes that may very well be about ethnicity or religion, or um, even touching on some things that are generally considered um, ethnic or racist tropes, but from an in-group perspective. So the jokes themselves become subversive. Um, they become punching up rather than punching down. Uh, they are um, send ups or satire. Um, that is what a black minstrel show would be like. Uh, medicine shows are, for the lack of a better descriptor, um, music, uh, performances and dancing that are intended to attract an audience so someone can come out and sell medicine uh, to the audience. Um, think of it like carnival um, barkers, um, that sort of thing. There was a fair amount of acknowledgement that the medicine at medicine shows didn't actually work. For the most part, it was alcohol mixed with um, things uh, that were, you know, various flavorings. When it was bought, there was a pretty decent chance that the people buying it were buying it for the alcohol itself, rather than for whatever thing it was supposed to be curing. Um, that said, of course, uh, the quality of alcohol that was um, making up the medicine was frequently um, wildly unregulated and being created by people who had no real skill at operating a still. So, you know, bathtub gin is not the worst thing that you could potentially be getting at a uh, menstrual sh at a medicine show. Um, so Gertrude uh, Pridget marries William Rainey, um, known as Pa in 1904 and changed her name to Ma Rainey. So Pa and Ma Rainey. Um, they performed uh, as a duo, Rainey and Rainey, um, the assassinators of the blues. Uh, and they toured all throughout the South. Um, minstrel shows, circuses, tent shows. Um, and a, according to legend, uh, she was responsible for giving Bessie Smith uh, vocal lessons. Um, one thing that we do know is that she was generally uh, Bessie's 
um, mentor, having given her a couple of really important early opportunities in her uh, career. <clears throat> um, by the early 20s, um, uh, Ma Rainey had become the feature performer of um, Toba, which is um, by actual name, Theater Owners Booking Association. Um, it was a circuit of theaters throughout the South and through part of the Midwest, the lower Southern part of the Midwest, um, that Black performers referenced it as the T-O-B-A, as tough on Black asses. Um, you would work long hours and then be expected to be uh, on a show again after about a half an hour break. And then the very next day, you might be three or four towns over performing again. So it was a lot of travel. It was long hours. Um, the money was pretty good for the time, um, as long as you were living um, effectively a single life. In the case of Ma and Pa Rainey um, being together and traveling, it is effectively the same. It's, it was a very demanding life if you had family at home or if you had to support them with the money that you were making. Uh, in 1923, Ma Rainey signed a contract with Paramount Records. Um, and her recording career actually only goes from um, 1923 to 1928. Uh, so just shy of six years. Uh, but she recorded over 100 songs for them. Um, things like CC Rider and um, Bo Weevil Blues, which became um, massive hits and are considered classic uh, blues songs uh, even today and are covered by dozens of um, known, well-known artists from that point all the way to today. Uh, so she was supported by some huge names uh, at the time, or I should say, some of them were becoming huge names and some of them became huge names after having worked with her. But that includes Louis Armstrong and Fletcher Henderson, uh, Coleman Hawkins, uh, Buster Bailey, and um, probably actually less well known in these days, uh, both Buster Bailey and Lovey Austin, but in their time frame, um, quite well known musicians. Um, if you have not seen it, I cannot recommend um, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom uh, on Netflix enough. Uh, it is a fantastic movie and um, very accurate um, in so far as the fact that it is actually, you know, relatively fictionalized, um, which is, you know, the way that it is with most things like, yes, this is based on a true story and we've fictionalized it to create a, you know, a narrative to tie together all of these historical uh, events. Um, but, you know, uh, I could go on and on about both the, uh, the movie and the, the play and the book and, but, that would take the entire hour speaking only about Ma Rainey. So we're not going to do that, although she definitely deserves it. If you're not familiar with her work, do yourself a favor and hit the YouTubes um, or your streaming um, source of music itself. It's She's amazing and her music is fantastic. And she is one of my absolute favorite musicians. Uh, and when I say musicians, she didn't play a musical instrument except for her voice. Um, I don't make a real distinction between the two. Um, so speaking of Bessie Smith, uh, our next one is Bessie Smith. Um, between Ma Rainey and Bessie Smith, these are um, the foundational um, recording artists for blues. The earliest sets of blues recordings were, um, and acts were dominated 
by uh, by women um, uh, musicians uh, singers. So these are two out of the top five and um, probably the most well known and probably the ones who had the largest impact um, on blues genre as well as um, jazz singing um, without mom without Bessie there would be no Ella, there would be no Billy um, you know hell there'd be no Doris Day you know there'd be no uh, yeah so it goes on and on um, so Bessie Smith uh, was the first uh, major blues and jazz singer on record um, uh she came in with uh, a, a huge force i said ma rainey had been performing for um, a really long time and she did get the first uh blues record um but bessie dominated the charts um so much so that she was referred to as the empress of the blues which is you know, quite a big thing when you were still actively recording and people were referring to you um, by that title. So uh, even on her first records, um, which, you know, date to 1923, um, her, the, the passion in which she sung, um, like pushes through the uh, poor recording quality um that was taking place at the time and if you listen to her music now and you really just listen to the vocals all of the scratchiness and the hissing and stuff just sort of like can fall away um she's she's great her ability to communicate emotion um her skill at enunciation and everything is just fantastic um she honestly just had no competition. Um, uh, so I mentioned that um, Bessie Smith sang um, with Ma Rainey. Uh, I should say that not like duets, but she sang in the same show. And this dates back to 1912. Um, and she was definitely coached by Ma Rainey, although there is, uh, I mentioned that, you know, the legend says that she was her vocal coach. Um, it could have just as easily been like, here's how to be a black woman in a world run by white men and not get took, um, which will make a ton of sense if you watch that Netflix uh, movie, because Ma's got, Ma's got some standards. She expects them to be met. Um, in 1920, uh, Bessie Smith opens her own show in Atlantic City uh, and then in 23 moves on from Jersey to New York and ends up signing with Columbia. Uh, and her first recording is Alberta Hunter's Downhearted Blues, which becomes an instant hit and uh, an instant classic. Uh, and she worked and recorded um, steadily for the next you know, 10 years or so, um, using a lot of the top musicians of her time as her sidemen. They were happy to go in with her. Um, so again, we have Louis Armstrong, um, we have uh, James P. Johnson, um, Charlie Green, and uh, Joe Smith, who is her uh, favorite cornetist. Um, she did a summer tent show um, called Harlem Frolics, uh, and it ran for two years, uh, and it was super popular. Uh, and then in 1928, she did uh, Mississippi Days, and so these were um, full on, you know, uh, musical shows that had uh, bits of theater in them. Like, I wouldn't call it a musical. It was definitely like, I'm seeing these songs. There just happens to be sort of a theatrical thread, a narrative that ties the songs uh, together. Um, again, those are the two um, 
most influential uh, female blues artists, I would say of, of all time. Um, if you are unfamiliar with their work, uh, you owe it to yourself to um, give them a listen. Uh, we are going to move on to Big Bill Brunzi, uh, born William Lee Conley Brunzi in uh, Scott, Mississippi, which um, is right near the border of Arkansas. Uh, uh, Brunzi's family were um, itinerant uh, sharecroppers and descendants of enslaved Africans, um, given the uh, time frame of his birth, which is to say the um, turn of the century, like when we say descendants of enslaved African Americans, what we really mean is like grandparents, great grandparents kind of thing. Like his parents knew their family members uh, that had been enslaved. Um, so they moved from, uh, Scott, Mississippi to uh, Pine Bluff, uh, also still Mississippi, um, to work the fields there. Um, they had uh, extended family in that area. And that is where uh, Big Bill first learns um, some music. Uh, I'm sorry, learns some music, <laughs> learns uh, his first musical instrument, which is a a uh, fiddle made out of a cigar box. Um, he was taught how to play it by his uncle. Um, and he moved on from that to playing violin um, at community dances um, in a country string band and uh, for local church gatherings. So Big Bill moves to Chicago um, at the end of World War I when he gets out of the army. And he ends up meeting a gentleman by the name of Papa Charlie Jackson, uh, who was a New Orleans um, pioneering blues recording artist, uh, also with Paramount. Um, and Papa Charlie takes uh, Big Bill under his wing and teaches him how to play guitar um, and has him as his uh, accompanist for the next three years. Um, and Bruzny plays as a sideman, uh, as an accompanist for uh, a number of years, and then records um, a whole set of recordings with Paramount, um, none of which get released. Um, to the best of my knowledge, they never were released and were destroyed. Um, just decided that now is not the time. Um, they didn't like the sound. They didn't like the recording quality. Who really knows? Um, but he did a full session, which is going to be somewhere between six to 12 um, recordings, and not a single one of them um, ever saw the light of day. Uh, but he does in 1927 get his first record um, with Paramount, and it's House Rent Stomp. Um, and it is, it's a great song. Um, it, it, it gets played a lot. It becomes really popular um, amongst like the house party scene, um, the rent parties and such, um, but it's not really a breakout hit, um, but it is enough for Paramount to um, invest, uh, invest is the wrong word because it's Paramount. They didn't really invest in, um, black musicians, um, it helps them recognize that they can become, that they can make money off of him. And so um, he ends up writing, I Can't Be Satisfied, which is uh, his first great blues original song. And it becomes uh, a massive hit and um, helps him make a name with not just Paramount, but now a bunch of other record labels are, are aware of who he is and kind of like sniffing around his heels to find out whether or not he's happy at Paramount um, and if they can sign him. And if he is happy at Paramount, if he's not uh, going to be in the studio for them for a while, and if they would be, if he would be willing to record under a different name, um, in which case they would uh, 
record him and sell records, uh, which is a thing that is really pretty common um, in the mid teens, I'm sorry, the mid twenties, all the way up until the late thirties. Um, artists were signed by specific names to record labels and they were prevented from recording underneath that name with anyone else as long as that contract was um, active. So they would just choose a different name um, in the same way that, you know, if you were an author and you were signed to Random House, you could just as easily go to Penguin Press if you're going to use a different, you know, non diploma. Um, so there's a little industry inside information uh, if you're interested. Um, so 1932 is actually a pretty terrible time for the record industry in regards to blues. Um, there's only about half a dozen, and I mean like five to seven um, blues artists who are recorded during that year. Um, and that is pretty much the worst year since blues was created, uh, including all through World War II and all up to even, you know, today, the idea that there's only about six blues artists who make a, you know, a single record. And when we say record, you have to remember that a record is not like a CD. It is just one record. It's got one song on one side, you flip it over, it's got another song. So no records means, you know, there were only six people who made two songs each um, to be able to put something out. Uh, except uh, Big Bill is so popular that even during this worst year, he issues 20 sides in that year. So that's 10 records. Um, he is a tour de force. Um, if you haven't listened to his music, you certainly should. Uh, so Big Bill uh, tours with Memphis Mini and uh, acts as her second guitarist. Um, Memphis Mini is um, one of the other um, foundational um, female blues uh, vocalists um, of the, you know, mid twenties to early thirties. Um, and I love her music also, but we only have so much time. So um, let's give her a listen. Uh, so he becomes her second guitarist in the early thirties and as far as we know, he never actually appeared on any records with her. Um, he was just a uh, second guitarist for traveling, but because uh, her tour was, uh, had a pretty compacted schedule, he doesn't really record during that time period uh, at all. Um, but March, 1934, he comes out with his first recording um, since having joined Memphis Mini. And this time it was for Bluebird um, and their newly established Chicago studio, which is underneath um, Lester Melrose. Um, Lester really liked um, Bruzzi's style. And uh, it doesn't take long for Bruzzi to um, insert himself into Bluebird's uh, business operation. He effectively becomes the second in command at Bluebird, um, or at least I should say for uh, Lester Melrose, uh, and ends up doing uh, auditioning artists, um, picking out songs for different performers, um, actually booking recording sessions and uh, where necessary tour uh, sessions and acting as backup and support for other musicians who are recording to ensure that, you know, they have the right sound. Uh, he ends up doing like literally hundreds of uh, recordings for Bluebird um, between the late thirties and into the mid forties um, with uh, Washford Sam, um, Memphis Slim, uh, Sonny Boy Williamson, um, those of you who are aware, Sonny Boy Williamson won John Lee. Um, there are 
two artists who both went by Sunny Boy Williamson, um, which is incredibly confusing uh, if you're unaware of that and you just start listening to music marked as Sunny Boy Williamson and you can't quite figure out why they sound suitably different from each other. Um, I mean, not like wildly different, but you're like, oh, this is not quite what I expected. I mean, not entirely out in left field, but it's definitely got a different vibe. That's why. Two different artists, same name. Um, did I mention the fact that people would change their name when they would go to a new recording studio when they were currently under contract? Um, so there you go. Oh, uh, Washburn Sam was um, uh, Big Bill Brzezini's half-brother. And he was on a number of his recordings during that time. He was also recording for Bluebird. Um, Brzezini is um, probably the single person who is most um, responsible for what is known as the Bluebird beat, uh, which is a specific kind of like blues rhythm or uh, blues beat, um, which uses uh, trap drums and upright string bass. Um, if you listen to anything that's typical of Bluebird during that late 30s up until, I don't know, probably 46, 47, you'll hear like a kind of a, a definitive sound to it. That's Bill, uh, that's Big Bill Bruzny. That's, that's his sound. He created that and shepherded it into, uh, you know, the vast majority of Bluebird's music. And personally, I believe, um, is responsible for why Bluebird had so many hits uh, during the during the time period. Um, that sound ends up being the precursor to what is known as the Maxwell Street sound, um, which is where a couple of different recording studios were located, um, which eventually gets to be known as the Chicago Blues sound or post-war Chicago blues. Um, he basically just helped redefine um, music in a format that would prove popular in urban audiences. Um, and without Big Bill Bruzny, um, probably most of the kinds of blues music you were first introduced to either wouldn't exist or would sound wildly different. So all of your Muddy Waters, all of your Howling Wolves, all of your, um, anything that you associate with uh, an urban um, blues guitarist owes, um, owes a royalty to Big Bill. Uh, so let's talk about somebody who doesn't. Uh, Charlie Patton, uh, he is the first of the great stars of the Delta Blues musicians. Uh, so we just talked about um, sort of what became the Chicago sound and that urban um, blues beat, um, that upright bass and trap drums. Uh, Delta blues is a more rural sound, even when it comes out of um, the outskirts of a city, it still retains a very uh, rural country, um, we'll call it unrefined if you note the air quotes around it uh, because that frequently has some like negative connotations, but in this case, it's not, it's easiest to be thought of as um, more, um, more visceral sound, um, less about orchestration and um, scoring and more about uh, like that, that raw emotional power, uh, which is a signature of Charlie Patton. Um, he was a charismatic performer, flashy styles, really talented fretwork, uh, which say uh, guitar, the frets are the things that go up the neck of the guitar, the, all the little metal bars, the strings, fretwork is working those. Um, he was incredibly flamboyant. Um, if you've ever seen Jimi Hendrix, if you've ever seen um, Chuck Berry, 
if you've ever seen Stevie Ray Vaughan, um, if you've ever seen any rock or metal guitarist from the 60s on and all of the things that they're doing with their guitar and their lap, you know, in front of them, beside them, behind their back, on the floor, um, that all was done by Charlie. Every single bit, none of that's new. Charlie Patton created pretty much all of that. Um, and he inspired a legion of bluesmen uh, and um, rockers, um, heavy metal heads. Uh, but the ones that you're probably most familiar with and most directly connected to him um, are Sunhouse, Robert Johnson, um, Jimi Hendrix, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Um, I mean, help slash from Guns N' Roses. Like, it's just his, if I had to say that there was one person who had a outsized influence on um, American modern music and what we think of when we think of guitar for American modern music, I don't think you could find somebody who fits that bill better than Charlie Patton. Um, but he also led the pack in all the excesses that you would tend to associate with those same metal and rock uh, guitarists. Um, high flying lifestyles, full of liquor and women. Um, his performances were, uh, are legendary, like literally legendary. Um, is playing at rent parties and juke joints and plantation dances. Uh, every blues musician, every wannabe blues musician um, for a generation uh, following, um, during and following Charlie Patton had either heard stories or told stories in regards to um, his performances and some of the crazy things that he would get up to uh, on the stage and off the stage and behind the stage. And I'll let you use your imagination. Um, he had an incredibly loud voice. Um, there are statements uh, and claims by contemporaries of his that he could be playing um, in a juke joint in the middle of a field and people could hear him unamplified for 500 yards. Um, how much of that is true is anybody's guess. Probably not very, but um, his volume is a thing that he was incredibly well known for, um, which is great considering the time period in which he was coming in. Amplification, including um, microphones for singers, uh, were not common. And again, he was playing in juke joints and house parties and plantation dances as much as he was playing in nightclubs and dance halls. And those first sets that I named did not have anything resembling like portable microphones for singers. So he developed um, a real ability to project. Um, he coupled that with uh, a very percussive rhythmic guitar style um, that was, I mean, that was groundbreaking that specifically departed from the kinds of uh, guitar work that um, came before him and was specifically designed to be entertaining um, to a very uh, raucous um, read drunk and high audience. Um, he didn't actually start recording until pretty late in his career, uh, but he did 60 songs in less than five years, uh, which includes his best-selling first single, which was Pony Blues. Um, Patton is generally regarded as one of the original uh, foundational players, um, musicians of putting uh, blues into a strong syncopated rhythm. Um, he would 
create uh, this tone that was just like able to cut through um, the noise around him. And he did this by tuning his guitar up uh, a step and a half above the standard pitch, um, which if you're a musician, that means something to you. And if you're not, don't worry about it. Um, it sounded different than the other people playing guitars and it was easy to pick out. Uh, that's not meant to be condescending. It's just that's the easiest way of being able to explain it. Um, but if you listen to uh, Charlie Patton and you listen to, I don't know, listen to Sun House, you listen, listen to Robert Johnson, um, and you'll be able to hear a distinct difference in just how his guitar sounds, not even like what he's doing with it, but the literal sound that his guitar is making um, stands out. Um, his compositional skills uh, on guitar uh, was pretty well known. He had this ability to um, pick up several different themes um, as like a background accompaniment um, within a, a single song. So you would have like these um, themes like, oh, I recognize this part of the song or I recognize this, this melody that's being played or this particular sub rhythm and it'll come back around and then it'll come back around and it'll come back around. And he would do it in a way when he was writing so that it was layered. So you weren't necessarily completely aware of it, but he was priming you um, to be able to respond when he dropped out the other um, instruments or he dropped out the other lines and that one thing held um, as the main thoroughfare, and it was for the lack of a of a more con of a better contemporary phrase, it was like when the beat drops. It's like, oh, I didn't know that this is the thing that I was waiting for until I hear it. But now there is this like visceral emotional response, um, and that again was that was purposeful. That was something that he wrote into the music. It was intentional. Um, he was known for uh, his slide work um, and he would play his guitar on his uh, lap like uh, a Hawaiian uh, steel guitar um, and would uh, work the frets with a pocket knife. Um, but he was also capable of doing it in the more conventional manner using uh, a brass pipe in place of a bottleneck uh, and was pretty well regarded and amazing on both of them. Uh, oh, uh, he also would uh, slap and pop his bass string. Um, and he was one of the first guitarists to do it, uh, which is about 40 years before the first funk bass players um, started uh, doing that same thing to create the, uh, that, that bass that signature bass sound that you hear um, from people like Bootsy Collins. Um, we are at about 10 minutes, so I'm gonna move on to a couple of uh, the jazz, and again, air quotes, because at this particular point in time, the difference between jazz and blues is very fluid. Um, so Kid Ori, uh, was one of the um, great pioneers of New Orleans uh, and Dixieland jazz. Um, he was a, one of the early trombonists and pretty much defined what uh, was known as the tailgate style, um, which is using the trombone to play the rhythmic bass line. Um, uh, in the front line uh, behind the trumpet and clarinet. So mm, even though it's a brass instrument, it's being played as if it were a, a drum or a bass. Um, but at the same time, um, his use of uh, glissando uh, became, because he used it so much and so well um, it became his signature and then it became a central element for New Orleans jazz. And uh, gliss or glissando is uh, on a trombone, uh, essentially when you're moving the slide as you're blowing. So normally it would be like ba, 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 or ba, 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 ba,
ba, ba, and you stop your breath as you move to the next note. But for him, it would be ba. So that, that sound that we tend to think of like, oh, like that's a trombone. It has that sort of like sound to it. Um, that was not a popular thing. Um, that was not a well-known thing. That was generally considered um, by classically trained musicians, bad technique. Um, but as is the way of blues and jazz musicians and quite honestly, um, black art in general is taking a thing that is considered lesser than um, and elevating it to a point and showing what can be done with it in such an amazing and fascinating fashion that um, it forces a um, re-examination um, and becomes a central tenant um, to the point where that is the thing that most people, when you talk about a trombone, uh, that is the sound that they hear in their mind's ear. And if you were to ask somebody to like, what does a trombone sound like? Um, I would say seven out of 10 times, they will demonstrate a glissando. Um, and again, that was effectively Kid Ori. He wasn't the only one who did it, but he's the one who popularized it um, and made it a central tenet of New Orleans jazz. Um, and if you know about jazz history, New Orleans jazz is you know, for lack of a better phrase, um, the original jazz. Yes. All right, I thought we had a question, uh, but apparently we just had a lovely child saying hello. Um, as a father myself, I, I appreciate that. Um, moving back to Kid Ori uh, for uh, another minute or two. Um, so Ori starts off uh, originally as a banjoist um, and there is a fair amount of um, belief that because he started off as a banjo player that that greatly informed how he approached his music as a trombonist and that um, if he hadn't started off with a banjo, the tailgate style may have never actually been, um, I don't want to say invented, but it may never have become like the defining, one of the defining elements of um, New Orleans and Dixieland uh, jazz. Um, so by 1911, uh, Ori was leading probably the most popular band in New Orleans. And uh, amongst that, he uh, helped shepherd uh, the careers of um, some of these names you're not gonna recognize. And if that's true, look them up. Um, and a couple of them you definitely will. Um, but Mutt Carey, King Oliver, um, a very young Louis Armstrong, uh, as well as Johnny Dodds, Sidney Bechet, and Jimmy Noon. Um, so trumpets and clarinets, and they all worked in his band, and he taught them the business. Um, he taught them how to play uh, within his style, and he took their sounds and wove them into uh, his, his own music, which allowed each of them to be able to find their own own voice rather than just playing Ori's chosen songs, Ori's chosen way. Um, Kid Ori ends up moving to California uh, and records the first two titles um, by a Black New Orleans jazz band, which is Ori's Creole Trombone and Society Blues, um, under the band title of Spikes Seven Pods of Pepper Orchestra. Yeah. Did I mention that when you were under contract with one um, recording company that you might record under a completely different name? I think I may have mentioned that. I will probably end up mentioning it at least once more before this is over. Or maybe not at this point. I think the point's been made. Um, and 25, uh, Ori moves to Chicago 
and he's playing regularly with King Oliver um, and records a ton of classic sides with him and Louis Armstrong in both his Hot Five and his Hot Seven uh, bands uh, with Jelly Roll Morton, with Johnny Dodds, with Bessie Smith, Ma Rainey, and uh, a bunch of others. Um, he also was largely responsible for mentoring both um, Benny Goodman and Charles Mingus. So um, he had chops. And I think we have time to maybe try and get the last two in. Um, Benny Moten, uh, actually I shouldn't say the last two, I've got like a million because I wasn't sure which ones I'm gonna talk about, but uh, I think I can get two in. Benny Moten, um, one of my all time favorites, uh, he was born and raised in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, for those of you who are not real hip on the weirdness that is sort of middle America. Kansas City is not in Kansas. Kansas City is in Missouri, but it's right across the border from Kansas. I don't, you couldn't make this up. Um, he led the Kansas City Orchestra, which was the most important of the regional uh, blues-based orchestras um, in the 20s throughout the Midwest um, and was largely responsible for developing the riffing style that would um, kind of define the 1930s big band sounds um, from a jazz uh, swing perspective. Um, I mean, there's always big bands like, you know, um, Paul Whiteman and, and stuff where the riffing was just, you know, verboten. Uh, but, you know, the popular um, swing bands of the time uh, really utilized that riffing style. Um, he and his band were known for um, a hard stomping beat that was extremely popular in Kansas City. Um, and by 1929, his band had refined its sound, um, having recruited Count Basie, Walter Page, and um, a Hot Lips Page or uh, Orrin Page, no relation to Walter Page, by the way. Um, uh, Walter Page's uh, walking bass lines uh, gave the music just an incredibly um, new feel, just something that was not being heard of outside of Kansas City. And within Kansas City, was nobody was doing it as well as uh, the Kansas City Orchestra. Um, and then you have Basie's uh, syncopated piano uh, playing where he's filling in space or highlighting other players. <clears throat> um, and then uh, he added Jimmy Rushing as the primary vocalist. And that group created um, what is the most recognizable um, style of jazz music in the 30s and 40s. Um, what later would be further refined and known as the bassy sound. Um, and I'm gonna get one last one in. Mary Lou Williams, uh, born Mary Alfreda Scruggs, um, was a pianist, an arranger, and a composer. Um, she wrote hundreds of compositions and arrangements. Uh, and having been on well over a hundred uh, records, um, wrote uh, writing and arranging for uh, Duke Ellington and Benny Goodman. Um, she was a teacher and mentor and friend to Thelonious Monk, Charlie Parker, Miles Davis, Tad Dameron, um, Dizzy Gillespie, Bud Powell, um, born in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, although she grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but we won't hold that against her. Um, she was a true musical prodigy, um, having taught herself to play the piano at three years old. Um, and I don't mean like plinking around and chopsticks. I mean, no, like full command of the piano starting at three. Um, she is a brilliant brilliant um, pianist, a brilliant composer. Um, for a really long time when people would ask me like jazz wise, like who do you think is just like the best composer? And I, I used to say Duke Ellington. 
And uh, then I started paying attention to some of the credits and I'm like, oh no, Mary Lou Williams, um, hands down, not even close. Um, she is a goddess amongst mortals and you really owe it to yourself to um, hunt down her music and listen to it obsessively. I mean, um, and listen to a song or two and see if you enjoy it. Uh, and I think that is about my time. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Damon. Um... Oh, I can't hear you. I don't know if that's me. Oh, no, that's me. I left, I let off my finger from the space bar. <laughs> oh, so I want as PB and J's representative to thank Damon for coming to us and sharing with us. I think you just muted yourself again. Okay, I'm not relying on the space bar anymore. <laughs> so I want to thank Damon from PB and J. Thank you so much for coming and sharing with us all these great musicians and the history. Definitely great stuff for us to research in further. Uh, please help us Support the Black Resilience Fund. Please donate to PB&J. Uh, look for the link in the chat. I can also share my special graphic. <laughs> Thank you I don't so know much. If, I don't know if this is something that can be done, but um, if you can send me the recording, I would be happy to be able to put together a, a playlist, a YouTube playlist of uh, the artists and everything that's offered here. And if you let me know who's donated more than you know, the minimum, I'd be happy to be able to let you be able to send that on to the people that are in this recording. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely grab your contact info and converse with you. I was planning on publishing our video lecture after this month on YouTube. So it'll be a yeah, if, if you can get that to me early, then I can work on that today or tomorrow to be able to put together uh, a larger, I mean, I'm not going to necessarily get all of them, uh, the best tracks, but I will, because I need to acquaint myself myself, but um, that might be an additional incentive for those that are able to donate. Um, and if you're not able to donate, then you can, then those that can donate can donate on behalf of others. Yes, definitely. And, uh, yeah, just want to say thank you so much, Dan. Thank you. Uh, feel free to unmute and give some applause or a thank you. This is a great time to shout with joy. <laughs> thank, you. Applause, thank you so much. Uh, later this month, on the 17th, we actually have Anita White, a Lady A from Seattle. She'll be sharing with us a small lecture and giving us inspirational, an uh, inspirational story about her struggle with over her name and everything she's been going through as a black lady of the blues and just trying to have uh, authorship over her own name. <laughs> So she's amazing. She is amazing. So look forward to that. I sent a link in the chat so you can look. I just published this event. So feel free to come back for more lectures. We have more stuff coming this month, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. All right. Any quick questions before we shut off the recording? No? All right. Recording on.